Oh, yeah, 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 my friends. You guys know me, I'm Beto Gudiño, all the way from Costa Mesa, California. Say it with me, California. I love the sound of that word. And today we have a special guest. You guys know me. And <laughs> uh, I've been wanting to talk to Peter Ants for the longest time. Peter Ants is a Bible scholar. He's a little bit out there maybe for, for conservative people when it comes to theology. But nevertheless, his latest book, Curveball, which I just read, it's so good. It has so many good points about the predicament of faith and evolution <laughs> so we're gonna talk a little bit about that if they really intersect if they have anything in common if we can agree to disagree so anyways <laughs> peter and welcome to the show how are you doing today thanks better great thanks for having me awesome okay well you guys know me first we go to the beliefo meter to kick us off with the episode and for that let me just kick it off right here beliefo meter what's the emoji we're gonna start with today and it's that skeptical emoji sounds good to me <laughs> okay peter um why are you resonating with skeptical emoji on this i don't episode? know i just I, it's what i always am i'm sort of that's my default mode that doesn't mean hostile you know it just mm. means to me it means it's it's curious too you know curiosity and skepticism go together and it's Uh, I think just how I'm wired pretty much to process reality. Mm -hmm. So take it or leave it. That's <laughs> okay. the way it is, you know? <laughs> There it is. Skeptical emoji. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I, I wanted to be a professional soccer player when I was 16, 17. I mean, ever since I was maybe like in grade school. But eventually, when I was 17, I realized, okay, this is this is not going to work. I was already too late in the game to become a pro. And when I was reading your book, it seems like you went through a similar journey, but with baseball, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so let's talk a little bit about that. I don't know much about baseball, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> but I do know a little bit about um, disappointments in life when things don't uh -huh. don't pan out the way we want so why don't we start with that i mean how was that journey for you like wanting to do having a, a picture of your life and not turning out the way you want it yeah i mean in part it was a bit of growing up you know and just mm -hmm. realizing that things don't always happen the way you want them to but you know i i wanted to play baseball ever since i can remember and um I, I wound up being pretty good at it. I was a pitcher and, you know, not, not, not the greatest or anything like that, but good enough to be noticed by people when I, when I pitched. And, um, I really, really wanted to play professionally. That's, uh, that's all I ever wanted to do. And, um, after my college season ended my last, my senior year of college, when that ended a week later, I hurt my elbow pretty badly. Mm. And if that happened today, I would have probably had Tommy John surgery, which is a rather complicated surgery to put your arm back together. But, uh, you know, that wasn't a thing back in that day. And um, I tried, I had tryouts lined up that summer and I was going places, New York and Baltimore and things. And um, I just, I just didn't have it. I couldn't, I couldn't get it done. And it was, it was a moment where I thought, I assumed that God would pretty much do what I wanted God to do mm. if I just prayed enough and I said the right things and I did the right things. And of course, that didn't work. And so it was really the first moment in my life. I was um, 21 at the time. It was the first moment in my life where I really had to come to terms with maybe I don't really know what I'm talking about when it comes to God. Maybe God is not at all like what I pictured God to be. And uh, so that that's really kick-started um, a long journey on my part uh, that went into all different th things over the next 40 years or so. And here I am on your podcast talking about it. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's so good because uh, I love that idea of like things not turning out the way we want in life and learning, but also uh, there's a connection to God 
with that, yeah. right? Like God didn't didn't help me in the way I wanted my life to go in a sense, right? And and mm -hmm. maybe that's even where the concept of envy comes in when you see other people prospering and what you think, right. oh yeah, they're prospering in their passions or their you know whatever they're good at. Mm -hmm. And you're like, how come that didn't happen for me, right? And then all these questions about like, is God even real? Does God even care about my own life? And you have a, I'm paraphrasing, but you say something along the lines of like, you had a faith that was based or cemented in fear. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of that because, I mean, I, I want to know uh, what that was like for you. But also, it seems to me when I was reading that, I'm like, a faith cemented in fear? It doesn't sound like a faith at all. If no, it has I don't to think be it cemented yeah, I, in fear. I agree with you, yeah. So what but was I that for it, you? Well, the fear, the fear was about getting God wrong. Mm. Like saying things or believing things that aren't right. And uh that's that is, you know, to be driven by that kind of you know, fear of like getting it wrong. And then what will God think if I utter something that's not absolutely correct? Mm. And yeah, that that's been a part of my life as well. I'd say it's not really so much a part of my life now, but it certainly was thinking that, you know, God is sort of looking over our shoulders to make sure our theologies are always correct. Mm. And a truly faithful person never wavers from what they believe. They just don't. They're always going to be strong and steady and move forward. And in my life, that just didn't work. And mm -hmm. so moving away from, you know, a fear-based model of faith to one that's more curious, that's the way I like to put it. Uh, that's been very healthy for me. And I think for a lot of people, too, that I've talked to, they've grown up in that state of fear of just impending doom and judgment on God's part. And I, I just don't think that that represents what God is like. That's my opinion. Mm. Wow, that's so good. So when I think of the phrase you use, like you were, you had fear of getting God wrong. Mm -hmm. That That's where my emojis kick in. Because I think, you know, the first emoji I have, it's called blasphemous. And I think <laughs> that's where the idea of like, oh, you're getting God wrong. That means it's blasphemous. It's out of the, you know, the, the, the proper maybe way of thinking about God. And yeah. so, I mean, that raises me the question. First, I love that there's a there's opportunity for people to choose and to to be even called blasphemous, right? But right. also the idea, like, is there ever room for convictions? Uh, what's your approach when you see people who are, like, really strong in their convictions, whether it's, you know, a different religion or, you know, the Christian faith or even, I don't know, fundamentalist Christian backgrounds? Um, mm -hmm. Is there room for that? Is that... A healthy space could that be a healthy space or oh sure yeah i definitely think so i mean i i'm not against conviction i mean i have convictions too it's just sometimes those convictions carry us for a time mm. and then if they don't carry that weight anymore i think it's good to be honest with ourselves and say you know, maybe my view of God has to change too. Maybe God isn't the way that I thought God was. You know, I get this question a lot from people saying, listen, I hear what you're saying. You're you're talking about God very differently than what I'm used to. And I agree with it. But I had all these experiences when I was younger in churches that I wouldn't necessarily want to go to now, but they were important to me. What do you think of that? And I, I, I firmly believe that, well, I think you met God there. Why not? I mean, I don't think God is limited to any of our conceptions, any of our thinking. And um, I, I just, to, to me, the problem, though, is when people are driven again by fear to not change ever, as if God doesn't want you to grow. I, mm -hmm. I think God does want us to grow. And that means growing into bigger ways of understanding what God is like. You know, I I don't think I had a handle on God at the age of 21. My my understanding of God changed as a result of my baseball experience. It took a couple of years, but it changed. Mm. And I think for the better. And the church that I was attending before might not have liked that. Mm. But that's okay because that's where I am, you know, and and I think to get back to your your original question here, I want to give other people the latitude that I needed to have. 40 some odd years ago, 
right? We're all, we're all human beings. We all see things partially. None of us sees things clearly. I don't see things clearly, but I've I've developed some convictions of my own that I think are important to hold on to. Wow, that's good. What are some of those convictions um, that you'd say? Well, I think you know, yeah. for for me, I would say things like there's a whole lot I could say about this. Um, I think God is fundamentally love and mm. uh, is is knowable and relatable. Wow. But also at the same time, absolutely steeped in mystery, and I can never possibly comprehend God. Wow. I mean, what what kind of silliness is that to think that I can actually comprehend the creator of the multiverse? You know, I mean, what yeah. I, this is this is out of my league entirely. Hmm. And and it's in and that acknowledgement of God as mystery is actually for me very encouraging and very comforting. Mm. because it takes off the plate my having to know everything right yeah uh, so that's a good that's one of the, that's one conviction wow that's good okay yeah so let's stick with that conviction so if we have uh so it seems to me it starts with like you said curiosity and and even the sense of like i mean if god is god if there is a god that is, i mean one we can get to know him but at the same time if he's like the entity that i don't know rules over the universe in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, how could we think that we can comprehend that being <laughs> in its in, in right. its fullness, right? So there's something to that. But also the curiosity, I think it's there because we wanna we wanna know, right? So and I, I think your convictions are very similar to mine. And I'll tell you I have two and and see how we resonate with each other. Because mine is similar to how you said God is love. Mine is God is good, mm -hmm. which for a lot of people sounds cheesy, but I mean, it took me 40 years to get there, right? right? And, mm -hmm. and I'm okay, yeah, like goodness has a source. But the other one, which is, I mean, to me, it's interesting, and I would love to get your, your input because I think, uh, you know, as the more I read scripture, the more it's evident to me at least that Jesus is God. And that's my second conviction like, Jesus is God. So, I understand the picture of Jesus as the, not just the embodiment of God, but the embodiment of goodness. So in that mm -hmm. sense, when I read scripture and it says, like Jesus says something like, everything there is to know about the Father, I have made known to you, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there's a sense of like, there's still mystery for sure, because I mean, we cannot comprehend sure. it all. But mm -hmm. in Jesus, I feel like I find somewhat of a completeness of that kingdom, right? Like Jesus called it, the kingdom of heaven is now here. And then everything there is to know God the Father about the Father has been revealed through Jesus, right? So then I start thinking of relationships and I start thinking of like, oh, wow, yeah, like Jesus did miracles, but that wasn't the main point. Sometimes the main point was forgiving sins, right? Like the paraplytic, uh, uh, paraplytic that mm -hmm. comes down of the roof in the house, and I mean, you're a Bible scholar and I know you're a little bit more focused on like Old Testament stuff. But um, what do you think of that? Like, do you resonate with Jesus as as um, uh, the way to the Father, like the, the completeness, the fullness of God on earth, something like that? Yeah, I think um, I do. But I, I, I would there also want to emphasize, and you said it yourself, that the 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 mystery of Christ mm. <laughs> is something that we shouldn't look over. I mean, Jesus. Th there's a reason people keep talking about this for the past two thousand years and still keep pondering and debating and thinking through. Um, you know, as as some have said, you know, Paul talks about Christ as like the the mystery revealed. Mm. But that doesn't mean, oh, now we understand. It, it, Christ is the mystery that's revealed, right? The God-man is mysterious. It, it's, it's not comprehensible. Oh, oh, I get it. No, you don't. You know, do we, do we understand the Trinity? Do we understand what it means for Jesus to be divine? No, we absolutely don't. We have thoughts about it, but these are matters of faith. And so I... I, I I keep relegating these things to the level of mystery, and that's not a cop-out. I think that's an acknowledgement mm. that I'm a very limited human being. 
I have very limited understanding of everything, even things that I think I know something about. I know a, a sliver of it. And mm -hmm. we're talking about the creator. And sometimes we get a little bit too confident in our own understanding. And that usually leads to some form of oppression or marginalization or, or things like that. History is replete with these kinds of examples. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I resonate with Jesus, certainly, but I also am very curious about how to understand Jesus and what Jesus said and what Jesus did, how to understand atonement, how to understand resurrection. All those things are really discussed by by thoughtful people of faith, not, not people who are mm. trying to rip Christianity mm -hmm. apart. So um, th there's, there, for me, let me put it this way, there's no conviction um, around which I don't also have some curiosity to keep asking some questions by what I mean. Even something like God is good mm. or God is love, you know, a lot of that depends on what you mean when you say God. Mm. Well, I know what I mean. Yeah, do you? I mean, let's let, we, we could un, you know you can unpack that with people forever. Um, what do you mean by love, or what do we mean by good? Because we have our own notions about those things that are a, a, a byproduct of our environments and how we think about the good and love, and and maybe our knowledge is, is partial. And it also depends on what you mean by is. God is love. God is good. That's that simple phrase, which I believe, is not obvious to me. Mm. But it's okay. You can believe something, and then pursue it. You don't have to understand it fully in order to pursue it. In fact, if you understand something fully, you stop pursuing it. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand it fully, you keep pursuing it. Right. So. That to me is all good news. There's, it's not bad. Saying mystery and I'm not sure is not bad news for me. It's actually recognizing my human limitations and the invitation to keep going further. Mm -hmm. Wow. So there's the idea of mystery. I love that. And the uh, you mentioned the word like multiverse. So, <laughs> I mean, that's I love that idea. Right. And in, in, in your book, you talk a lot about like evolution and almost like this being the main idea of the of the book of like evolution through you a curveball when it comes to your faith uh, yeah. because sometimes around our, our understanding of of creation or the world is it's uh it's fundamentally i don't know biblically based but in a sense that doesn't allow for any scientific proof or evidence to have a say right and i mean i it's so interesting because i i feel like when it comes to evolution and or maybe the age of the earth To me, it makes sense that it's been around for whatever, millions of years or billions of years. Mm -hmm. But the fact that as humans, like we we started really communicating with one another in the way we do, like especially I think through writing and and maybe mm -hmm. like language, seems so new to me. Seems like, I mean, that's not that old, right? In, in the term, I mean, in the long uh, vision of how old the world is. So mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, I don't know. It's almost like this is maybe super cynical, but it's like I don't care that much about evolution, right? Like it's whatever; it doesn't matter. It, I care more right. about like where do humans? When did humans start? You know, getting right. along or fighting their own battles or you no, know, like or, or thinking thinking abstractly about what's yeah. out there and why are we here and things like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that's definitely more recent. Um, mm. Which, you know, one thing I talk about in the book is like, but what about all those people who never thought about this stuff, but still lived 100,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago? Like, wh where where do they fit in God's plan to use that language, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it just the last few thousand years of humanity that God cares about, you know? And and I and I think we sometimes, well, not sometimes, I think we, we all do this, including myself, when we think of what it means to be human, we right away think of ourselves. But there have been different ways of being human for tens of thousands of years, mm. for tens of thousands of generations, where they weren't driven by a consumer mentality. They didn't, they didn't grow their own food, they hunted and gathered. Mm. And humans have been doing that for a lot longer than they've been producing their own food. 
which is only about the last 10,000 years or so with the agricultural revolution. So yeah, it's it's those things make me think too. It's not it's not evolution going back a couple of billion years. It's more when did we start being like us? Mm-hmm. And and what did that look like? Like when did the who made the first tool? Where does the art come from? How do they think of themselves in their lives? What happened to them when they died? You know, all these kinds of things. That those are questions that I think about sometimes. And I don't have firm answers to them, but I I have to think that that God is not just concerned about our specific human culture, which is what it is. We we have a culture that's you know very modern, very Western, very consumerist, very much the world is here for our benefit. Let's do what we want with it. That kind of a thing. That's not Mm. humanity. That's a particular culture of humanity. And I think the Christian faith can critique that. And I think it does critique that very Mm. effectively. Wow. Um, But, but yeah, it is, I, I mean, not to go on on here, but it is, I agree that that's, that to me is as challenging as anything, just thinking about where people came from and the fact that people have never heard of Jesus for 99% of the time that humans have been around. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's good. I mean, I love those questions, you know, because I'm, I'm very curious like that too. And and I think, I mean, my See, that's a skeptical emoji, right, Beto? That's, that's it's, the skeptical emoji we're going It's a skeptical right slash yeah. uh, blasphemous is like somewhere in that... In, <laughs> In that it's not section, blasphemous, but it's it's weird. You need to have yeah. a weird emoji, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I mean, to me, blasphemous is kind of like shocking. So yeah, it, it fits all those. But I love those ideas, and I think that's why. Uh, I mean, to me, it's so, so interesting that I always think like, for example, this is the Christian podcast, but I feel like it was the it was the name that could help me think about God and Jesus, and specifically, right, like my upbringing in Christianity, because mm-hmm. I, I did grow up kind of like in the Protestant church in Mexico. But with oh, really? that, yes, okay. in Guadalajara, Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, but then, like, allow the questions. I feel like in, maybe in our, maybe it's this generation, right, and and that got so much, that got a foothold of their convictions, so much so that it's like, there's, there's no questions asked, like, no questions are allowed. And... I mean, I think there's there's something healthy in asking questions. I think it can maybe lead people astray, whatever that looks like. But, but I think there should be a space for questions. And my idea, my hope, is that this podcast can, by using these emojis and the spectrum of belief, that we can be somewhere within, you know, the mystery and the asking questions and the getting to know from one another and, you know, learning from other people's experiences. Mm-hmm. And right. as you were talking about that, like the the God of, you know, where do we come from as humans and things like that, it, it sounded to me like wrestling with God could be a lot like like wrestling with ego, right? Like wrestling mm. with our with ourselves. What do you think of that? I mean, our uh, it's so interesting. There's a pastor. I'm just maybe I don't know if I should say his name or not, but um, yeah, there's just a pastor that says, you know, if if there is um. You know how we say we live in, a, some people say we live in a kind of like the matrix mm-hmm. where, you know, we're, we are maybe like computers and, and I'm going this place because I, I think it's a little bit related with the multiverse and the quantum physics that you talk about in the book. Um, but this idea that maybe like God is the encoder and human beings are within the code that God created Right. And yeah. and to me, I mean, that's interesting because when I think of human relationships, I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Right. The way we relate to one another is like we're we're the algorithm. We're we're in it. We make choices every day and the choices are based on our intentions. And sometimes we don't even know our true intentions. So, oh, right. Yeah. Right. Sometimes we do. But that's why I feel like, wow, sometimes wrestling with God is it's sounds a lot like wrestling with ego with our own desires like did did you did you resonate with that at all do you feel like there's space for that 
Well, I mean, I do think wrestling with God is inevitable. And in a way, it's tied to ego because oftentimes our understandings of God are bound up in our egos. Mm. Like we we think that what we know about God, that's true. Mm-hmm. And that's a very ego-driven mentality. I think to be open and say, I'm not, I think this is true, but I'm not really sure, that can be very healthy for some people. Now, the thing is, you know. I think there are times in our lives when being open and curious and skeptical and questioning is that's just going to be a normal part. I think there are other times in our lives when during pain, let's say, or during suffering, where we might actually pull back from that a little bit and and rest more in those convictions, as you said before. And I've I've experienced that too. Like sometimes it's like, all the other stuff goes away quickly. I have, there, I'm in trouble here, like like mm-hmm. the psalmists. You know, I'm in trouble. Where are you, God, when I need you? Kind of thing. And um, that's, I think, that's very helpful. I think wrestling with God and wrestling with our egos could be even two sides of the same coin because mm-hmm. they're tied together. And I think the wise person will be aware of that wrestling and how prone we are to creating God in our own image, as other people have put it. We all do that. Mm-hmm. The thing is, you need to be aware of it so that when you're called out for it, you say, ah, okay, I, I, I can see that. I need to be careful what I'm saying here or what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Wow. So we tend, I mean, some, yeah, you describe a, a scene where you're in San Francisco and it's almost like, I think people are you know, getting on their taxis and going about their day And it mm-hmm. was almost like the realization that, I mean, do people even care about the things I care about when it comes to <laughs> like finding out who God is? Like, it seems like you were in a journey of um, maybe from my vantage point, it sounded like, wow, he's, he's kind of like becoming a, a pastor or a scholar or someone involved in church. Right. And yeah. and it seems like when you're in that in that place, you see it's almost like a uh, what is it like a bird's. Bird's eye view. Bird's eye view. Right. Bird's and, eye view. Yeah. and it's like, wow, here I am thinking about all these questions where when people really they're going after their own day, their own life, their their own mm-hmm. rhythm, and maybe not necessarily, I mean, some maybe thinking about God, but some not. And right. almost the, the, the question of like, does this even matter? Right. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, that was so interesting to me because sometimes I, I feel like I resonate with that, right? That, uh, Mm-hmm. I don't know uncertainty. Uh, sure. So, what was that experience for you? Like the the is the world just too big to to or people? Yeah, I, like, I mean, it, I think it is too big for me to comprehend. And I think that moment when I was in a taxi and I had all these thoughts in my head that came rather quickly, I felt as if I could see how very small my view was mm. it's I, i it was really an ego deflating moment because i was looking at things from a very different perspective and saying i i'm going to this church to get paid to talk about god and i i think of other people as like there are two kinds of people people who think like me and people who don't i never said that to myself but i think i believed it I think I actually thought that. And I just felt very humbled. And, and the wind just went out of me, just sitting in that taxi for just a few minutes, really, is all it took. And coming to the conclusion that maybe I don't really understand things the way that I think I do. And it took a moment of being unsettled, of wrestling with God, right? Or wrestling with our egos, which again, I, I, I like what you said there. They're sort of connected, it seems like. Um, but it, it took uh, a, a discomforting moment to open myself up to that kind of a journey to say, you know, I just have to stay open. I can't hold on to things as if I have the whole universe figured out because I don't. Mm-hmm. And there, so that's where <laughs> like quantum mechanics kick in, like your, the <laughs> no, the side of your brain that loves uh i don't know scientific stuff uh, uh-huh. how did how did you get pulled in into like 
oh wow look at the quantum physics and this realm because i would love to you know like expand a little bit on those ideas well, i have a yeah, few i want to tell I, you but um, first how do you get there? i'm not a scientist you know um and i say that in the book pretty clearly i don't even do math very well but um i think see here here's what what some theologians will say they say it's how is it that the church can keep talking about God as if the last 100, 120 years of science never happened? Mm. Meaning things like Einstein and also then the quantum revolution that happened a little bit after Einstein got started. And I, I resonate with the idea that it shouldn't be a special thing. It should be what we do. You know, when, when we say God is up there looking down, that is a statement that rests on a different scientific model of the cosmos. An old one, you know, before the Copernican Revolution, before Johannes Kepler, before Galileo, before anybody else around that time. Um, this this is a new way of looking at the universe, and it has implications for how you think about God. You know, is God up there? Well, there is no up, actually, in the cosmos. It's all relative to how you're standing and where you're standing. You know, the earth is round. There's no up. And if God is up there, then where exactly is God? like hiding behind a galaxy, which one, you know, um, and, and it, it gets to be a little ridiculous, actually thinking like that, at least for me. And then, you know, lo and behold, Christians for almost 2000 years have had thoughts like this. And they've, they've, they've tried to come to terms with how to think about God with our universe changing in front of our eyes. We're learning more and more. And how can our talk about the Creator take into account the actual creation that we see. So quantum physics is weird, you know, and evolution is weird, and Einstein and cosmology are weird and big and incomprehensible, and maybe God is incomprehensible too. I think God has to be incomprehensible if the creation is so incomprehensible. How can God be any less comprehensible? Mm -hmm. Wow. So there you have a saying in the book about photons and <laughs> photons are light. And, and the, you, you mentioned this thing called the intelligent observer paradox. Yeah. Which is, is basically like photons saying, hey, God is what or whoever's watching, right? Somebody's watching, look busy. Uh, and I mean, that's that's so interesting because w even when I read Jesus nowadays, right? And you know the, the the gospels i feel like man like he's talking about quantum physics right <laughs> like uh like some of the miracles i'm like that's have to be in the realm of quantum physics like there's no way to explain that other than you know and and i'm not saying quantum physics explains it i'm just mm -hmm. saying it's as weird as quantum physics right the, the way quantum physics could be right. a photon existing and not existing at the same time yeah. um right and right. and i right. think okay that makes sense when you no, know, Jesus says, if you had faith as small as the mustard seed, you could tell a mountain move and it would move. It's it sounds mm -hmm. crazy, but in quantum mechanics, it sounds possible because if if right, right. it's yeah. almost like if you can think it, it can happen. Right. In a yeah, sense. I mean, there's there are theologians who would agree with, roughly with what you're saying here, and I and I express that somewhat in the book as well that. Um, you know, miracles are not like impositions from the outside, but actually the nature of reality, and you could say on the quantum level, sort of asserting itself, right? So weird stuff happens in our universe on the very small level. And, you know, does it affect the big things? That's, that's a debate people have, but the universe is weirder than we think built into the nature of the universe seems to be very, very weird things. And some have said, well, miracles are more tapping into the weirdness of the reality that we live around rather than 
God who's outside of creation looking down and sort of zapping things occasionally, mm-hmm. right? It actually comes from within. Mm. Um, wow. Now, it has to be called up somehow, yes, which I haven't done, you know, but that's that doesn't matter. You know, there, there are some people who probably have ESP. I don't. I don't think I do, you know, mm. and and I think there there are people around us that do tap into the unseen in in ways that most of us don't, and I think they might be hinting at that bigger universe that that is strange and odd and not at all like what we see. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. So final, I mean final, because I I I want to go to the emojis to summarize the episode, but. When I read Paul, for example, and he says, you know, like he talks about faith being the evidence of things unseen. Um, and mm-hmm. then, uh, yeah, is there, would you say, I mean, this, this is my view, right? And I could be totally like on blasphemous emoji, but you were talking about something that's activated from within rather than the God out there like mm-hmm. inputting from from wherever he's at, right? So right. Uh, that resonates with me because it seems like when when I read the Gospels again, right, like Jesus is looking for faith. He's not, I mean, th- at this point, there's no Christianity. There's Judaism. Right. And and he commands, like, when, whenever he finds faith, even from outsiders, like from non-Jews uh, mm-hmm. people, right? And I'm like, wow, is that, f- is faith, like in, in the realm of quantum physics, like is faith something like from within that we activate as humans that in a sense makes something happen? Like is, is there space right. for that? Is that too blasphemous? Is that? Well, uh, it's a little blasphemous, but not too much. Um, I've, I've heard it all, by the way, so you can't scare me with uh, anything. But, <laughs> great. But, you know, what if, again, some people talk about God this way. What if God is in us? What if the spirit of God, the energy of God, we, we would call it the spirit in, in, in the Christian tradition. What if God is already a part of us and in us? You know, what if our whole breath is a gift from God? What if what if our very existence is dependent on the one by whom all things exist? Mm. So in other words, maybe, maybe again, it's not like it's either God doing some from the outside or we're generating it on the inside. Maybe God's not on the outside. Maybe God is in and through everyone and everything. You know, that's, I mean, the term for that, which, again, this may be blasphemous for some people until you let me explain it, okay? Panentheism. Not Pantheism means everything is God. I don't believe trees are God or my mm. cat is God. I don't believe I'm God. Um, but panentheism means um, God is in all things, but also distinct from all things. The The energy or spirit of God permeates everything from subatomic particles to the largest galaxies, because all those things exist because God is the author of existence. And I find that to be a very, again, a comforting thought and a very intriguing thought to, for thinking about the nature of reality. And it helps us understand that, you know, you don't have to climb a mountain to find God. You don't have to go off in a rocket ship to find where God is hiding. God is in and around and through all of us. And I, 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 again, I think that's very good news. I don't think that's, that's, that's blasphemous for some, but it's divine for others. You know, I mean, yeah. it d- depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> yes. Oh man, that's so good. So it's called panentheism, right? Yeah. And I, and I read it on your book, panentheism. And so what you're saying is not everybody, I mean, do you think this is your, your, expertise as a Bible scholar, do you think most Christians uh, lean into panentheism or against it? Oh, I don't, I don't know if they're even thinking about it, most Christians, but I think wow. um, if, depending on their experiences in life, depending on, you know, their family or their church where they were raised, all sorts of things, I, I imagine you could have very different opinions on that. I think it's probably fair to say that um, those who are, you know, more part of conservative Christian culture would balk at that idea and not be very comfortable with it. And I understand that. I'm not trying to shove it down anybody's throat. 
it's just for me, it makes no sense to think of God as sort of, you know, the sky daddy, as some people call him, up in the sky, <laughs> taking up time and space just like the rest of us. Wow. You know, yeah. and that's why when people say things like, I need evidence of God, I'm like, I don't think you're going to find evidence of God the way you want it because, mm. you know, you can have evidence of chemical properties, you know, evidence of things that science can actually treat, but God is not a thing that can be proved like a black hole or the orbit of a planet. I just, I don't believe that. For God to be God, God has to be a, apart from that kind of thing, because it's, again, it's by God that all things exist. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right? So I, yeah. It's a different category entirely. Yeah. Um, but it, it can trip people up to think of God as in and through everything, because it's not a common way, at least for Western Christians, to think about. And I understand that. I just it makes the most sense to me, given what we know about the nature of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's so interesting because I I resonate with that so much, and even though I feel like I'm I'm not so maybe scientifically inclined, like you sound on your book. Uh, even though you say you're not exactly a scientist, like right? I sound in my book, like exactly you sound because like you have all these you no know, equations you're talking about and stuff. <laughs> That's so yeah, good. but I don't know what they mean, right? Well, imagine <laughs> me. I don't even know what that is. But anyways, the uh, to me, it's uh, what you're describing sounds like man. That should be what everybody not not what everybody believes, but that should be almost like a given. Like God is. Uh, when I read you know, the New Testament, at least, it's it sounds like God is everywhere, but he works through us and in us, and he's the all in all and things like that. So it's mm -hmm. like, wow, why would anybody like not not think that he is active and you know, like moving and mm -hmm. weaving through human relationships? I mean, it seems... Yeah, rather than being making occasional cameo appearances yes in different ways it's just god permeates all of existence and and again the 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 reason i think that isn't because i woke up one day and said let's be blasphemous or let's say weird things that upset people i felt cornered by reality mm. that i wow. had to think differently about god that yeah. would actually account for the way we understand the world around us and the thing is, what, what I think many people don't understand is that theology has always done that. Mm. Theology talks about God in ways that are informed by the culture around them. That goes, wow. that's the Bible does that, biblical writers did that at every sentence. I think believers, people who have been a Jewish or Christian, they've always done that too, because God can't be exhausted by our thinking. It's always going to be pushed, pushed, and pushed beyond where we are. Whoa, that was fire right there, man. I love it. Okay, so it's time to summarize the episode or think about the future with our emojis. So with that, we're going to go to the blasphemous emoji. So in, in your, wherever you're at right now, what do you think is the most blasphemous idea? Whether it's an actual <laughs> blasphemous idea or what you think other people are feel like it's blasphemous. Um, my most blasphemous idea, I don't know if anybody really understands what the cross is about. Ooh, can you expand on that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, there, there are, you know, in, in the history of the church, there are different ways of understanding the atonement. Like, what, what did Jesus do on the cross? And there are different ways of thinking about that within the New Testament itself, which is very interesting. That uh, Different people have different angles. Um, and I, to me, it's like, I'm, I remember just pondering that years ago where I was just mind, minding my own business. And I said to myself, I don't think I really understand the crucifixion. I mean, I, I, I know the words to say, and I know things that I can dance around it, but really zeroing in on it. See, I think the whole Jesus thing is mystery from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Resurrection is mystery, too. Like, how does that happen? What does that actually mean? What are the implications of it? And what happened? You know, those are those are things that scholars deal with all the time. And you, it's hard to avoid that stuff. So that's probably one of the blasphemous things I could probably say. But they're all rooted in a respect for mystery. Mm. That's really what it comes down to for me. Wow. Okay. Not understanding the crucifixion 
pretty blasphemous right there. That's it. Oh no, don't don't have organ music. <laughs> this is okay. a skeptical emoji. Skeptical emoji. So, um where do you see skepticism played out or you know, what what are you still having questions or Yeah. Um probably like what we talked about earlier, not evolution or sciences so much, but actually cultural anthropology and, and looking back to humanity and um, realizing that the religious traditions that that I'm a that we're a part of, um, namely the Christian tradition, which is rooted in the Jewish tradition, um, that's only been around for a very short time. So I'm I'm skeptical that that story provides for us all the answers for the nature of reality. It came into the picture very late. And and the view of the beginning of life and things like that in the Bible um, relate their thinking and their times and their way of approaching this. And it doesn't really help me... It, you don't see a lot of cavemen in the Bible, mm. right? You just don't see that. You don't wow. see the first tool. You don't see, you know, the first boat. You don't see the first fire. I mean, you don't see that. But that, that so my skepticism there is about the, the Bible's ability to help us with some of our questions that we have because we live in a modern scientific world. Oof. That's good right there. But I'm fine with that. Okay, so if you're fine, we're on inspired emoji. <laughs> Where do you see hope? What gives you inspiration? Oh my. Um, I think honestly, I think what gives me hope and inspiration is just keeping my mouth shut every once in a while and just <laughs> I like walking outside. I like walking among trees and hills and and I think that gives me joy because it bypasses my analytical brain. Mm. I just immediately experience. And I don't know if this would be under divine or something else, but it's, it's you know, I could put this probably in any of those categories, but it's very meaningful to me. And it gives me, a, it gives me a grounding mm. that um, I really need. I desperately need to be grounded in something other than what I'm thinking. So good. Okay holy emoji what's a holy idea according to peter ends um okay um we experience god best when we treat each other well fire right there i love yeah. it and lastly what's a divine idea according to peter ends um <laughs> I feel funny even trying to answer that because it's it feels arrogant of me to say here's a divine idea um let's just say i haven't progressed in my maturity enough to have a truly divine idea Oof. okay so how does that sound so no divine idea <laughs> i have no divine idea i think i know what you mean by that but okay. um maybe holy is as far as i can go Okay. Well, that's new. I love it. Maybe Kevin. that's a first. I love it. Really? I did. No <laughs> one's done that before. Okay, that's good. I'm yeah. glad. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> All right, my friends. Well, Peter and this has been amazing. A great conversation and a phenomenal read, Curveball by Peter Ants. Peter, where can people go find more about the work that you do, uh, your teachings, and you know, your website, maybe? Yeah, I think just just everything is at the website, thebiblefornormalpeople.com, one word, obviously. And, uh, you know, I'm on social media, Facebook, all that kind of stuff. We even have a TikTok. If you ah. find us on TikTok, The Bible for Normal People, it's, it's you know, we have fun on there. What do you do on, on TikTok for The Bible for Normal People? What kind of videos? <laughs> well, sometimes we just like talking heads, explaining things. We have ah. sometimes conversations, sometimes funny um Uh, you know, little gimmick things that we do that, uh, you know, are, are, are pretty good. So we, we try to have some fun with TikTok, which is what it is. It's just fun. 
Nice. I love it. All right. Well, my friends, there you have it. Another awesome episode, Christian Podcast. You can visit us at christianpodcast.com. It would be so helpful if you can give us a positive review wherever you're listening or watching to this episode, whether that's Roku TV, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and all those good places. I'll see you guys on the next one.